So yes, I wanted to talk a little bit about moving from individual contributor to product leader, some of the skills that you'll need to work on to, to make the transition and some thoughts on how to actually get the job. So I think from my perspective, the reason that I was interested to talk about this was because in my somewhat over 20 year career now in product and tech and maybe 10 of, 10 of those years being talking more about the, the leadership side of that is I very much made it into being a leader in the first place by being a really strong individual contributor and then being promoted to be a really to, to be the leader of a team of people that did that kind of contribution. But I reflected on this the other day and I was started to, I started to think, well, actually, I never really got any training. I never really got any guidance or coaching or mentoring or anything. I was kind of just left to it to some extent and kind of go through the school of hard knocks approach, which I mean, I'm not saying that it was done with any bad intentions, but it's 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 not quite the same. And I think that, that these days, what with all the resources and all of the ways that we can share information and learn from people that have come before us. I think it's really interesting to share some of the reflections of things that I've learned from my career and try and help people understand some of the areas they might concentrate on when they go forward. So hopefully this will be helpful for some people. So we're talking about product leadership and of course the first question that we should ask is well what is a product leader and how does it differ from being an individual contributor and we should be completely clear and say that of course many individual contributors will exhibit many leadership capabilities and there's this whole idea that product managers are there to lead by influence and lead cross functionally and be strategic that's 100 percent true but i do think that it's 100 percent it's 100% valid to say that product leadership does require some different skills and to focus on some different areas. But one of the first things to call out is that there are many, many job titles that represent some form of product leader. And you can see a bunch of those on the screen right now. And I think it's fair to say that if you go on, say, LinkedIn and look for some product leader jobs, you will find lots of these job titles basically representing more or less the same job. There'll be little details maybe, but a lot of it seems to be the preference of whoever it is that's actually picked the job title for that. For that, you know, they, they, They've not necessarily done that particularly mindfully. They've just picked a job title that makes sense to them. So one company's chief product officer is another company's head of product, is another company's VP of product and so forth. And where I'm going with product leadership and, and the way I like to look at it is to, to say, well, how close is that person to where the decisions are made. And when I'm talking about product leadership in the context of this talk, I'm really talking about the most senior product person in the organization, or if it's a bigger organization in a business, business unit part of that organization. So the person that's responsible for the product strategy, the product vision, and probably a team of product managers and other product aligned roles potentially as well. Now, some people will say you don't need to be a manager to be a leader, and that's 100% true. But at the same time, in the context of this talk, I'm talking about that person who's kind of leading the product organization, hopefully reporting to the CEO, but we'll come back to that later on as well. And if we think of some of the core responsibilities of that product leader, and we'll go into some of the skills that you need to, to drive some of these shortly, one of the core responsibilities of that product leader is to build, coach and maintain an effective product team. So again, that team of product managers and associated product roles who are there to build and execute on the strategy that's defined and make sure that we're delivering the best value to our users 100%. And that product leader is there to make sure that that team is everything that it can be. And that team, of course, is therefore working towards uh, an overall vision and strategy. The vision and strategy, not just of their individual bits of product or their product lines that they're working on, but the overall product portfolio strategy, if you're in a very small company, maybe that will just be one product, but over time that may turn into multiple products. And the product leader's job is to bring all of that into one coherent whole. And also, once you've got a strategy and once you've got a team, you of course need to be able to execute on that. So making sure there are no blockers in the organization, making sure that the team can have all the processes and all the support and the tools that they need to, to get the product day-to-day -day work done, executed properly, and again, value into the hands of the users. And to do that, we, of course, really want a healthy 
thriving product culture. So to make sure that we're working cross-functionally, that we're not command and control, that we're not top-down decision-making, that we're very empowered, that we're sitting there and making the best decisions for our users based on user feedback and making sure that there are no impediments to that. And being a fierce advocate for the, both the value of product thinking, for the, but also for the product team and the position of the product team within the organization. So to ensure that that team is respected and has a seat at the, at the relevant discussions and they're not just seen as like a delivery team or just some people that get stuff thrown at them, but fully empowered decision makers leading the product forward. And ultimately, another thing which I've been ruminating on recently is the idea that product leaders, maybe somewhat obviously, you need to really drive business impact from the, that product thinking as well, and not just be idealists that are sitting in a castle, but actually trying to convert that into true business outcomes. But the golden rule, as far as I'm concerned, of moving from individual contributor to leader in any organization, but especially with a product bent in this particular discussion, is that what's got you to where you are now is fantastic. It's fantastic that you've had all of those skills and you sh that they're gonna set you in good stead to have great discussions with product managers going forward. But you can't just do those, but a bit more. It, technically speaking, product leadership could be considered a bit of a different game with aspects of product management, but it's also a wider role. And you can't just sit there being pulled back into your individual contributor mindset and doing lots of individual contributor work and expect to succeed and that's certainly a mistake i've made in the past where maybe i've felt oh i can just help here or i can help there and you end up being a less effective leader because you're spending too much time doing the work that frankly your team want to do anyway and now it's a bit of a cliche i will say i'm not the first person the person that said this but your product isn't your product anymore when you're a product leader your product very much becomes a portfolio of products so to say or your product could also be considered the product team itself. To some extent, your product could be considered the entire organization, depending on the size of the organization and how much of it is a product organization versus the services or product mix or however the organization is laid out. So your ambitions are wider and your responsibilities are wider and you need to accept that and be okay with that and approach it with that mindset. And I've been thinking again a bit more recently about the importance of business acumen to product leaders. And that's not to say that they don't need to be product people or they don't need to know about product stuff. But at the same time, a core part of the role of a, business, of a product leader is to translate product thinking into things that resonate with the rest of the business. So with the CFO, with the, the CTO, with the leadership team, with all of the say of the investors, because ultimately they're not going to particularly be interested in listening to bits of books that you read at them. They're interested in business results. Now, everyone loves a matrix, and I've decided, or a quadrant, I've tried to lay this out to kind of show what I'm talking about. Now, I've showed this to one person before this, and I don't think they liked it very much, so I'm hoping that it will resonate with some people. But if we consider, you may have some people who don't have many PM skills at all, and they don't really have much business acumen either. I don't really think they should be in a product leadership job, frankly, but it could be that their company is over-indexed on delivery or kind of see it as a kind of engineering project management role or something like that and given that person a product leader title that person got a lot of work to do to be an effective product person otherwise they're always going to struggle or if you've got high pm skills but maybe lower on the business acumen level then you're a super duper contributor now we need super duper contributors but if they want to become effective product leaders they need to build that business acumen to make sure that they're actually being effective at the top level which is where we want to be. We want our product leaders to be the fantastic mix of PM skills and business acumen. And that's our target. That's where we want to be. And we want all of our product leaders to be, because if we don't have that, what we tend to find is you get the industry expert or the business expert or the strategy person who comes in to take over the team, very little PM experience, finds it very difficult to resonate with product managers in their team, they're very good at the big picture talking stuff, but trying to stick those two things together, it can lead to quite a disconnected team and lead to certain levels of ill will. Now, I'm not saying that that's across the board. I know there are people that work in that sort of position that are very humble and work with great lieutenants that can help to get that work done. But if they're a my way or the highway, really opinionated, strong opinion, strongly held type person, you could be in for a tough time. 
So I absolutely want to see as many heroic product leaders as possible and do our best to support people on that journey to make sure that we're promoting from within as much as possible. But product leadership isn't for the faint-hearted, and I think that it's fair to say that product management isn't for the faint-hearted either. But at the same time, if we consider product leadership, we're really talking about product management times by all of the different product teams that you have in the organization, plus loads of additional problems stuck on top. So you have to be up for this. And I'd say that if you're not up for this, don't just tumble into it. There's a lot of talk at the moment going on about dual track careers. So if you want to progress in your career and you want to be a super duper contributor and make sure that you're doing those of really interesting and cool stuff and delivering and working on the things that you enjoy, your next step doesn't have to be leadership as long as your company supports that. And if your company does, doesn't support that, then you should potentially consider finding a company that does. And don't just Peter principle your way into a position that you don't really want just because it's the next position in the chart. I absolutely believe that senior contributors are you know, the lifeblood of an effective product organization as it scales. But let's assume that you do want the job. What are some of the skills that you're going to need to actually be effective at that? Now, I'm not the cleverest person in pretty much any room, and each of these specific areas could be considered talks on their own. So this is going to be a very high level kind of summary. But at the same time, I really wanted to give people ideas about where to look next. So. I've recommended a book for each of these slides, which, I'll, which will pop up and I'm happy to send that around afterwards. So you can go and have a read and maybe try and develop some of your thinking in some of these areas if you've, if you've not maybe experienced it so much so far. So one of the key things that I would say, the key responsibilities of any product leader is to coach and develop their team. So making sure that your team are the best versions of themselves that they can be. So to make sure that you're not just concentrating on your own development, but you're mainly fun, mainly focused on the development of all of the product people in your team, making sure that you identify what they're good at, what they're not so good at, and helping to come up with a plan to develop them to be better at those things so that they can be effective and be satisfied in their career, but also help to deliver value again for your, for your users and for your business and keep the team at top efficiency. Petra Villa, great book, Strong Product People. Loads of approaches to ways that you can do that and also some canvases and PM wheels and loads of resources that can help you identify and, and engage with some of those areas. So I definitely recommend that. You then also need to think that, well, again, your, your job isn't to be a, an individual contributor. Your job is to build a strong and healthy product culture in the organization. So making sure that you work in the way that we really want to work as product people. So building great, effective, cross-functional teams empowering them to deliver the best results possible and prioritizing out, uh, outcomes over outputs and ensuring that we remove all impediments to that as, as far as possible, and really selling the benefits of product thinking around the company. Now, that's a lot about communication, and it's a lot about soft skills to try to, to remove those blockers and a lot about trying to make sure that you identify where these problems are, have a bit of systems thinking approach and, and clean it up as much as possible. You don't have to look further than... Marty Kagan and Chris Jones is Brooke Empowered to get some great tips on front to back how you can do that. But this also supposes if we have these cross-functional teams, we need to have a way to organize these teams in a way that really delivers value as best as possible. Again, this is a tricky role. This is not something you generally have to do when you're an individual contributor. Your job is to work out what is the best way to arrange the people that you have in your organization and the teams that you have in your organization to deliver value in the most frictionless and effective way possible. So again, moving into team dependencies as much as possible, arranging around product lines, whether you need a platform team, all these different things that you can do to remove friction in one way, but potentially add friction in other places by moving stuff around. It's a very tricky balance and it's not something that you can instantly get good at. But you do need to become a bit of an organizational architect to, to help that. Because some of these people that you're trying to arrange, if we're considering people like chess pieces for some reason, but all these teams that you're trying to arrange, you need to, you're not going to be responsible for all of them. Like You're not going to be directly responsible for all of them. So you need to, again, work on your soft skills, work on that communication, and really zoom out and make sure that you're understanding the best way to organize your team. And there's a fantastic book, Team Topologies, which goes into lots of approaches that you might take to try and work that out as well. Because of course, there are many ways to skin a cat. 
Now, hiring, of course, you want to hire people and sadly sometimes fire people. And that's something, again, you don't get to do really as an individual contributor. You do need to build diverse teams and you do need to build effective teams. And in some ways, hiring might sound like a fun job to do. And of course, it is fun to get great people in and bring them into your team and watch them grow and flourish in your company. Absolutely, 100%. But it's also something that not everyone's actually very good at. I mean, I've been looking around at various job specs before this to kind of get a sense of, of what's out there just to kind of back up some of my points in this talk. And I think it's fair to say that there are a number of really terrible job, well, <laughs> there's a number of really terrible jobs out there, but there's also a number of really terrible job adverts out there as well. They kind of look like they've been stitched together out of two different job adverts. They're either too wide or too, or too narrow, or they're over-indexing on certain things, or they're using language, which is really exclusionary. And that is not an exception by any means. That There's a lot of that going on. And being good at hiring and being really purposeful and strategic about your hiring is something you need to get good at. Kate Leto, great book. Definitely go and read it. Loads of canvases in there and advice on how you can actually hire people that you need rather than just hiring just random people because they tick some boxes and you know, so forth. So like, it's an important thing that you've got to get good at. But also firing. Now, obviously no one wants to fire anyone. I've had to fire people before. It was a very horrible, it wasn't great. It was, it was not a good part of, of my career to be sitting in rooms with people telling them that, that that's it. it, it's the end. And you obviously don't want to do that as much as possible. But at the same time, if you can't develop people and if they can't contribute in the ways that, that, that is needed for the team, that is a discussion you have to have. And I think that the most important thing is to try and frame it in such a way that these people are going to be better off, both themselves and you know, for the team as well, moving to something that suits their, their, their skills and their interests and their, their talents a lot better. So you, have, you do have to develop a, a, tough, a tough skin, and it's not a pleasant thing to do, but trying to work out ways to constructively and empath empathetically move people on when they're not working out, it's tough, but you do need to get good at that. And of course, we have to think about strategies. Your, your job is, of course, very heavily weighted towards the team and bringing them forward, but you also need to consider this overall top level strategy. So the cliche again, learning to see the wood for the trees, but you do have to zoom out. And I think this is one of the toughest things for good individual contributors to do, to actually sit there and say, I'm not going to concentrate on what's going on today. I'm going to start to look at what's going on in the future. Where could we go? What are adjacent opportunities? How can we support the business in different ways? What partnerships could we enter into? And there's a lot there and we're not going to fix it in a slide. But the basic point is stepping away from your day to day work and realizing that your day-to-day -day work actually is thinking of the future and not just worrying about day-to-day -day execution that your team should be empowered and supported to do. It's a big mindset shift, but you have to get through it. Um, many books on strategy, of course. Uh, Radhika Dutt, who spoke yesterday, has uh, brought a good one out. Uh, there's plenty of others that you can look at too, but I definitely recommend that, uh, checking, checking Radhika's out and, and looking at that kind of long-term two, three, five, ten-year vision. Where could we be? And once you've got a strategy, you should hopefully be able to use that strategy and that vision to inspire the team. So obviously, it's really easy to inspire teams to go and do something that's really meaningful to them. But I'm also talking about day to day inspiration as well. So making sure that you're honest with the teams and give them all of the context and the information that they need. And being, may I say, it, radically candid with them, giving them all of the great feedback and also some of the less good impact so that you can inspire them to be better in a constructive way, rather than kind of just ignoring them and letting them fester. You want people to be with you for the ride. So you want them to be aligned with you. You want to give them exactly the right amount of information so that they can understand the impact of the things that they're doing, understand how they're contributing and the value that they're delivering. But at the same time, I've also seen leaders crushed maybe under the weight of their own problems, walking around with a sour face and hunched shoulders, shouting and swearing in meetings because they can't handle something that's happening to them. And whilst it's completely fair for them to be having problems and, and maybe need to find other ways to get help for their problems, they absolutely shouldn't be raining those down on the team because some people, maybe more junior, more inexperienced people, are not going to be able to survive that. They're going to get, they're going to panic. They're going to feel terrible themselves. They're not going to understand. So you do need to be open and honest, but you absolutely do not need to just rain down on people whenever you've got a problem. You need to work out a way to give them air cover from yourself as well. 
Radical Candor, just mentioned it. Fabulous book around how to have good, constructive, continuous conversations with your team to bring them along for the ride and make sure that they're performing effectively. But let's talk a bit more about that, you know, your problems and trying to avoid raining them down. I mean, that doesn't mean that you should do it, but you definitely have problems and you do need to sort yourself out and look after yourself. So this is a very inward face facing skill that you need to develop as well. There's this kind of attitude from some people that once you get to the top of the tree, you know, you've made it into leadership, you're at the top of the snakes and ladders board and you're done. And of course, you're not done. You're never done. Everyone's always got some kind of pressure or stress. And it's about the level of your ability to deal with it, but also the kind of the, the breadth and, and the types of thing that you're being stressed about. But you absolutely do need to look after yourself. You may be suffering from imposter syndrome. You may be worrying about things in your team that you can't share with them. You may be worried about certain skills that you don't think you have, that you have or, or ways that you don't think you're contributing. So you need to get as much support as you can for yourself as well to make sure that you can be the most effective leader that you can be. So be that coaching, be that building up a mentoring network and talking to other leaders in your local environment or on the internet. Make sure you look after yourself because if you don't do that, you can't be an effective leader. Leadership can be lonely from time to time, so you do need to be able to look after yourself. So Mark Abraham wrote a fantastic book talking about all the different tensions in product management and some of the ways that you can diffuse them, which I would also definitely recommend. So if you're still up for this leadership thing, then how do you actually get the job? And I'm talking really about the first job. So like the first time that you move from being an individual contributor to being a leader, either at your current company, maybe getting a promotion or a new company. So going for a new role somewhere else. Now, obviously, you could also be going to either of these places as an existing leader. We're not going to talk about that so much, but we should also be conscious of the fact that existing leaders, if they've kind of happened upon leadership themselves and not been supported themselves at their current role, could need to reflect on some of these same things, too because they might not be the leaders that they think they are, and they need to be very open and honest with themselves. So if I'm going to get a job at a new company, in theory, this is relatively straightforward as a, as a concept, right? I'm going to go to have an interview with a company. I'm going to tell them about all the great stuff I've done, then ignore all the bad stuff I've done ever in my career and get the job. And you'd like to think that it'd be that simple, and you know, maybe if you're lucky, it is. But what you've got to realise as well is that when you're interviewing as a product for a product leader in a new company, you're probably not interviewing with a product person. You're probably interviewing with the CEO, maybe the CTO or the COO or however that company is laid out, but hopefully the CEO. And it's fair to say that your interviewer might not actually know what product leadership actually is, and to some extent, what product management is. And to some degree, you might say, well, what? But that's not as uncommon as you might think, especially if you have founders that maybe you know come from an industry and wanted to start up a startup to fix some inefficiency that they saw in the industry they might not be tech people and your job then to come in there they want someone like you to come in and, and help make them more of a product company but they don't necessarily 100 percent know what that means they don't care about your grasp of frameworks or what books you've read i don't even care if you've got a podcast which is a horrifying concept to me to be honest but what they do care about are business results. They want their business to be more successful and they're bringing you in to do that. And you need to speak to those motivations, not necessarily your own. Because being a product fundamentalist in these situations won't always help. I mean, unless you're lucky enough to be interviewing with someone who's read all of those books themselves and are desperate to do all of those things. So as product people, we love to think about all of the different ways that we can effectively product manage things and build products. And we love talking about all of the latest trends. We love talking about continuous discovery. We love talking about empowered teams and outcomes over outputs, quick iterations, MVPs, hypothesis-led development. These things all mean things to all of us, and we probably all agree that they're good ideas. And this whole concept of like everything depends and say no to requests and all of the stuff you see in all the Medium articles all over the place. But at the same time, if you just go and speak to, I hate to quote myself, by the way, but I kind of like my own quote here. You can't just go and read bits of book at people and expect to get the job. You need to translate the best of that thinking and tell this person that you're interviewing with exactly how this is going to help make their business better and not worry too much about whether it's 
whether you're doing your best Marty Kagan impression at them, because unfortunately that's not going to resonate with every single person. It can, it can feel abstract and it can feel woolly. And ultimately you can't do the job if you don't get the job. That might sound kind of dumb, but it's obviously true as well. You need to do what you can to get the job and then you can start to make some of the changes and do some of the things that you want to do once you get in there. So my personal recommendation is dial back the idealism and again, really try to find out what their motivations are as a company and speak to those. And companies generally in an interview process will be very open about what those motivations are. Like, are they looking to scale? Are they looking to be acquired? Are they still searching for product market fit? Are they drowning because of a lack of product processes? Are they looking to expand into new territories or are they looking to expand into new verticals? These are all things that you should speak to a lot more. Weave the product narrative in, of course, but ultimately, if you can't hit the notes that they're thinking about, it's going to be very tricky to persuade them that you're the person that should get that job. And I think it's also fair to say that as product people, we massively dislike making assumptions. Like everything depends. We want to verify stuff. We want to use data and we want to ask people and we want to do discovery and we want to do all the things that we all know that we want to do. But going into this interview, we're not this is a clean room. We're not, we're not going in there and being asked to kind of invent a strategy and then immediately execute on it. We can make assumptions. I had an interview once where I was given some data for a task for the, you know, the final round and they admitted in advance that the data wasn't actually very good. It was kind of spurious and I looked at it and realized that it was as such and spent a lot of time in the interview talking about how I'd validate that and all the things that I would test to make sure that was better and how I'd kind of get to an answer about what we should do. What they really wanted me to do was kind of trust that data, even though they said it was spurious, and say, what would you do if this was true? And my mistake that I made in that situation, which I'll never make again, if I ever look for a job again, is to basically try and be too, I guess, purist and say, look, this data, would, if I was working there, I would do this. But actually, they wanted me to assume a lot of these things were true and then weave the product around that rather than trying to go too far back into first principles. So basically, my, I guess my advice would be get off your soapbox when it comes to product management, get the job and then get back on your soapbox. But there's a couple of extra dynamics if you're getting the job at your current company as well. So you think that getting a job at your current company, whilst you have to think about some of those other areas as well, you think that you have a bit of a head start because you know the company, you know how decisions are made, you know what the product does, you know the industry, and that's fabulous. But at the same time, what you'll find is that any crossword or problem that you've ever had or off comment or anything like that could end up sticking in people's minds a lot more than, than you think it should. I remember once getting feedback from an exec saying basically, oh, that meeting that happened 18 months ago wasn't run very well, was it? It's like, well, actually, no, thinking back to it, no, it wasn't. But why is that coming up now? And of course, for me, that was a long past thing and we'd had many successful meetings since. But strange, surprising things stick in people's heads. Every single problem that's ever happened was on your watch or while you were there. It's not necessarily terminal, but it's definitely something that you need to get ahead of. So if you're aware of things that have happened in your past in the career that maybe a more <laughs> a more petty person would hold against you, make sure that you build some kind of narrative so that if that does come up, you can defend it rather than being caught off guard and basically looking less ideal than maybe this other person who could come in and be a change agent and have a fresh slate. So it's absolutely perfect to go in there with all of the, all of the stuff that you do know, but make sure that you're aware of the past that you do have and ensure that you have an answer for that so that it doesn't come back to bite you. And also, if you get the job, you're going to be potentially managing former peers. Now, maybe some of those peers wanted to get the job as well, and you're now managing people that wanted to manage you. Now, we all like to think that we're yeah, the, the better person and we can sit there and work that out, but these can be really tense and they can be really problematic. So you need to make sure that if you do get a job and you're now managing the people that you used to work directly alongside, whilst we're still going to be collaborative and we're still going to be empowered and we're still going to be as, as open and not top-down puppet master as possible, 
At the same time, there is a decision hierarchy and you are going to sometimes have to make decisions that they might disagree with. And if they're also disagreeing with your very right to be in that role, that is a very, very tricky dynamic. So having lots of face time with these people, understanding their motivations, clearing the air, making sure that they understand your motivations and being very explicit about the fact that, look, you've been given this trust. This is your responsibility now. Hopefully they're going to come along for the ride and you know, maybe we'll even see if we can give them additional responsibilities in the future if we can. But definitely don't just leave things lingering or put your hands in your over your ears because these types of kind of low level rumbling disappointments can definitely come back to bite you in the future. So just to close out, because I know we're just about at time, you might not get the job. You might go for the job, you might go through five or five or six rounds of presentations and meetings with all of the different senior leaders of the company and come away thinking you did kind of fine and sometimes you don't get the job anyway. And if you're lucky, they might even tell you why. But frankly, there's a lot of ghosting going on in the wider industry and that's not something that is not there in product either. And, but consider that it might not be you, it could be them. Like they might have very different opinions about what product management is or what product leadership is. They might be massively overweighting certain types of industry expertise over others. They might not like your answer to one of the questions that they somehow massively overweighted compared to all the other great stuff that you said. We talked earlier about how not everyone's good at hiring and that is also true of these people too. There are gonna be reasons that they weight or overweight or underweight certain parts of your skill set or certain parts of, of how you've represented yourself and it could just be them or it could be that the company wasn't quite right for you don't be disheartened you absolutely need to pick yourself up on and, and, and go forward but do verify that it's not you like if you do get feedback and if it's constructive then try and be as dispassionately as possible look at it and try and be very honest with yourself and say look actually yeah sure right that that bit wasn't great that's a thing for me to work on because the only way you're going to get better and get that next job is if you work on the things that, that maybe came up a bit lacking. And ultimately, it doesn't matter how good you are yourself. It's how good you appear to other people, which gets you that job. So basically, what next? I mean, for me, whether you get the job or whether you don't get the job, it's about being constantly aware of your own good points, your own bad points, the things that you need to develop, the things that you're really great at, and ensuring that whatever you do, you constantly reflect and challenge yourself to be the best person you'd be. But more than anything else, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, just make sure you look after yourself because product leadership is a fantastic role when it's going okay. Like you can make a lot of difference. You can be a massive force multiplier. You can make transformational difference to the products, the users of the products and the organizations that you work in. But when times are hard, it can be very tough and you need to make sure that you do make sure you look after yourself make sure that you're getting the support you need and hopefully be the most effective product leader you can be. And that is the end of my whistle stop tour through product leadership. And uh, obviously happy to take any questions now. If not, then there's a little QR code there, which if anyone still scans those things should take you to some of these places where you can reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or if you're not bored of my voice already, uh, go and listen to the podcast and listen to much cleverer people than me talking to me about this sort of stuff. Jason, th thanks so much uh, for a great talk. Um, a few a few points I noted down there during the talk. I, I really like the point around not being that kind of product fundamentalist. I know I've I've fallen into that trap in the in the past, and and really trying to think about translating, you know, what you know or the theory or the the Marty Kagan stuff, um, to to that CEO to you know to so they can understand how it's going to help them in their business. I thought that was a really really good point. Um, okay, so folks, we're just going to open up for some Q and A. We do have some there already, so thank you, thank you for adding those. Um, okay, so the first one, um, any tips for building early trust and starting to manage peers? What would you focus on in the first 30 days? Okay. Well, I think the one thing that we have to call out is the fact that there are going to be some people, like it depends on your initial relationship, right? There are going to be some people, <laughs> they might just not get on with them. And that's unfortunate and it's less of a problem. I mean, it's still a bit of a problem. It's less of a problem when you're working alongside each other and working on maybe different stuff. If you're there, their boss, then absolutely that can be challenging. I think one thing I'd say is it's worth being very explicit. I mean, I was 
in a position once and I kind of tried to fudge it a little bit because the person didn't seem that happy about the position that I was in and I kind of just sort of glossed over it as much as possible and tried to say oh we just work together it's like that that probably sounds great in an, in an egalitarian future world but at the same time you are as I said earlier you you, you are in you're basically in charge of the team right mm -hmm. whatever you think in charge means and again I'm not definitely not suggesting micromanagement or any kind of those dynamics but you're responsible for the team at least and ultimately your the decisions you know you're you're on the line for everything so I think that if it comes to for example trying to build trust with people that maybe don't think that you should have got the job or think that they should have got the job I mean frankly some of these people will leave mm. like some of these people if they think they're going to get the job they will leave and there's probably very little you can do to to, to stop that because they have ambitions and they want to go on and they want to go and succeed somewhere else because that door's been closed for them. But if there are people that want to stay and they, they're still on on board with the mission, then again, just having those open and frank conversations, try and build the bridges. You know, you've obviously not, well, presumably not cut their feet off to get into that position, right? You've not undercut them or insulted them or bad mouthed them or anything like that. And be very clear about that. You know, I got this role because of this and, you're still a really important and um, essential part of the team and, and we need to work together because I can't do some of these things without you and that the job of a leader isn't just to be the, the best at everything and try and bring them on that journey a little bit and try and big up the things that they are good at and what they can bring to the table to help you and realise that ultimately as a team you have to succeed together. Absolutely. Um, thanks. And thanks for the, the question. Um, okay, so we have another one. As a more entry level PM who would like to become a product leader in the longer term, any advice for the first steps I could take in the near term? Well, there's the old cliche, the other, the other old cliche around like, do the job that you want, not the job that you've got, right? Now, mm -hmm. obviously, if you're very early in your PM career, there's going to be a lot of development areas before you can even start to try to do the job that you want. So I think it's easy to say because of you know, the books and stuff that we call out, but like there are a lot of resources online these days, you know, far more than when I started out even. Read and read, read, you know, read the best of those books. Make sure that you're aware of some of the top level leadership thinking and understand what leaders think about. And I don't think it's just about product books, by the way. I think I, I spent a lot of time reading books around you know, that, that are aimed at more CEOs or more around financial performance or investment and stuff like that. And I don't need those in my day-to-day -day job, of course, but at the same time, it really helps me to understand the organization and, and what's important to other people in the team. So trying to expand your horizons a little bit so that you can start to understand why different people care about different things that maybe aren't the same things that you inherently care about, I think is important. And I think, yeah, just... Like there's loads of communities out there these days as well. Like there are there are peer communities where you can join up and you can kind of grow together and, and bounce things. And now obviously some of those are going to be very much focused on day-to-day -day work, but at least try and sit in on some of the conversations where you can see people that have already got to that position and the sorts of things that they're talking about and the sorts of things, the sorts of problems that they're having, because that's not going to make you good at doing that job, but it's certainly going to help you to understand it a lot more. And again, kind of identify areas that you might need to develop in your own thinking. Because, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm pretty sure that most product managers, as they develop through their careers, naturally build a lot of these leadership muscles anyway, because they have to learn all these soft skills and do the strategy work to and kind of be that influencer and, and, and be that person. But it's about working out which bits of that you need to amplify. And mm -hmm. you only really get to do that by by sort of watching the problems that other people have and, and working out what, what you need to improve. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I really like that kind of do the job you, you want to do as, <laughs> as, as well and, and to think about think about what you need to amplify. Um, OK, so just not only how do you develop executive presence? Yeah, so this is an interesting one. I think executive presence doesn't yeah, I mean, everyone's got a different opinion about what it means. Right. I think one thing that for me was very clear maybe a little while ago was. <laughs> Aside from actually understanding what it is that people want, want to, like the type of thing that people want to hear, there's this another cliche: brevity is wit. So, like, try and keep your communications as concise as possible. Don't over-explain, and don't um, what's the, don't go on tangents. Like, so 
I've found, and probably still these days, in fact, I'm doing it just now, uh, I've found that it's very easy while you're explaining something to go off in a different direction as something comes up that you're thinking about as you go. And you start talking about that thing instead. And hopefully you bring it back eventually, but ultimately you start to sound really unstructured. And that can be a, a big problem because when you're talking to, let's call them top level people, they're time poor, they've got lots on their plate, as have you, and they want to get to the, they want to get to the nub of the matter as quickly as possible. I th I, there's actually a, a really interesting book I read called The First Minute, which talked about how to get your first, all of the important bits of your conversation into effectively the first minute so that they know the type of conversation that they're going to have, not have a big, long, boring story, which sounds like it's really problematic, and then get to the end and it's all fine. And you're just like having a chat. It's like, look, leadership people, execs, they love to have chats as well. But if you're having a business conversation with these people, be very explicit, keep it as simple as you can, and cut to the chase so that you're not just sitting there sounding like an unstructured waffler. And that can really go a long way to making that, you know, whatever we want to call executive presence, it certainly gets you closer into that direction. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Jason. So we have time for one more question. Um, do you have to be a product manager to be a product leader? So it sounds like it's related to one of the, the earlier questions slightly. Obviously you don't because there are product leaders that aren't. And I'd say that it really depends. I mean, this goes back to that disconnected strategizer type idea, right? So someone who's got really high business knowledge, but maybe not so much of a product management background. Now I've spoken to people that have, you know, on the podcast even that have kind of gone into that role. And the thing that struck me about people that seem to be doing it well is that they're really good at understanding what they don't know. So they may have great industry expertise. They may have great general strategic muscles and they can use those to great effect to maybe provide that executive level coverage, but they're not a product manager. They don't really know how product, ma product managers work or what's important to product managers or how products get built. But rather than kind of just plowing on anyway, what they do is they get really trusted lieutenants or lieutenants to mm. come in and help them with that. So like they'll maybe have, you have a CPO and a couple of strong VPs that are there to do the day-to-day -day stuff. Now, for me, it's still, kind of disappointing that that has to happen. I would love to see more product managers and product leaders develop into that position because it only seems fair. You know, you've you've taken all the hits over your career, you know, you want to develop into that and, and then lead from the front. But yeah, I mean, I think my advice would be that if you're not a product person and you're getting into some kind of strategic product leadership position, at least know what you don't know and don't just try and trample over every, everyone because Again, like I say, like it's your way or the highway, which doesn't rhyme. But you need to you need to make sure that you you take advice and effectively execute through people that do know what they're doing, rather than just hmm. kind of trying to bluff it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I, I kind of think of it like if you've played the game on on the pitch before, if you, if you played football before, um, you know, it, it generally is easier, I think, to to kind of to to move into into that type of role. Not not always, as you know, for yeah. any football fans out there, there's some great some great uh, leaders and coaches out there that never played the game, but it generally makes it easier. Um, yeah, I think that those are in the minority, though, right? Like for great okay. football coaches that didn't play at the top level, or at least at any level uh they're, they're pretty rare there are some like you say yeah. but I, I i'm always going to put my money on the good business acumen good mm -hmm. product person because i think that they've got the most yeah. to, to offer but of course yeah. there's a big development task to go to make sure that those people get from that quadrant to that quadrant absolutely so jason we're just out of time um so thank you so much again um just in case people haven't come across your podcast or you know where to contact you uh where's the best place to find you yeah so i'm fairly active on twitter so um i've got that on the uh put that on the slides so, so one jason knight on twitter um i'm on linkedin obviously as well and then one night in product.com you can come over there and find me and listen to some of the fantastic, oh, I'll, put, I'll, I'll put it in there. Let me just uh, paste it out. But yeah, so um, I'm releasing new episodes every week. So as, as you obviously know yourself, so it's um, it's been a, been a bit of a journey and, and I've been lucky to speak to many of the people that, um, that have written some of those books and hoping to still go into the future and contribute as much as possible to, to the community.
Absolutely. And look, I, I think I, I found a lot of benefit myself and, you know, even just on the topic we're talking about today in terms of moving towards a product leader, um, there's lots of great podcasts on, on there. I know you're talking to Marty Kagan and Rich Miranoff and folks like that. So it's a, it's a great resource. Highly recommend it. Um, so, Jason, thanks. Thanks so much again for your time and uh, hope to see you again soon. Yeah, I'll be around. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.